preaching from Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19, beginning in verse 1. It's a familiar passage of Scripture. It goes along with some things we talked about last week. So this is a passage of Scripture that you'll be very familiar with, even from the youngest of the children here. We're familiar with this passage of Scripture. From those who can't even read, you're familiar with the passage of Scripture because you remember the song. And, you know, we have a lot of deep theology in songs, and especially, you know, of course, the kids' song because of the deep theology in this song. And Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. Everybody remembers that song. So from the earliest age, we learn about this guy. But this day is important. I want to look at Zacchaeus, but we want to look at a tale of two rich men. A tale of two rich men. And we start with Luke chapter 19, beginning in verse 1. If you stand as the scriptures read, please. Luke chapter 19, beginning in verse 1. Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. And he sought to see who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd. For he was of short stature. So they ran ahead, so he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him. For he was going to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him, and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. So he made haste, came down, and received him joyfully. But when they saw it, they all complained, saying, He's gone to be a guest with a man who's a sinner. Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor. Have I taken anything from anyone by false accusation? I restore fourfold. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the lessons we learn in Bible stories. We thank you, Father, for the lessons we'll hear today. Father, as they apply to each of our hearts, make that known to us. Address us at our, our greatest point of need today, need for change, need for comfort, need for a challenge. Father, we ask that you would make that known very clearly to us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. A tale of two rich men. Now, you may say, okay, I can kind of put my brain in low gear right now and maybe just park it in neutral for a while because rich doesn't apply to me because you know how we are. We're just old country po folks down here. Well, not so fast. When we talk about wealth, we may think that we're not rich, but when you compare us to the rest of the entire world, we are very rich. Did you know that only 12% of the world's adults own a vehicle, even have access to a vehicle? How did we get here today? Well, I walked, but you know, I still have a vehicle. I, I don't think anybody else did. 12% have a vehicle. You have a vehicle, don't you? So we understand by the world's standards, we're rich. 60% of the world has adequate housing, 40% does not. Only 72% of the world have clean water, and probably less than that. When they talk about clean water, they're talking about clear, drinkable water. But if you go to Honduras, you do not drink that water. So we understand water may be available, but not advisable. So we understand I can turn on a faucet anywhere in the United States and drink the water, and it may have a funny taste to it, but pretty much it's all safe. You have clean, clear water. Only 60% of the world has indoor plumbing. 40% does not. Only 65% of the world has access to a healthy diet. Oh man, we have more than healthy diets. In fact, we have so much healthy diets, we make them unhealthy, don't we? So we realize we are rich. And the average income per household worldwide, we're talking about per household, not per person. So these are two paycheck households. The average income per household worldwide, $12,235. That means per person, 
about $6,000. So we realize when we talk about a tale of two rich men, don't automatically assume this passage of Scripture does not apply to us because we are quite wealthy in a lot of different ways as Americans. Well, does that make us guilty because we're wealthy? Absolutely not. But we need to consider the fact that God has truly blessed us in a lot of ways that we should be thankful for. Let's look at the city. It was called Jericho. Well, we remember Jericho from the Old Testament, where, of course, the walls fell down. But the, the, the Jericho continued to thrive as a city as it was incorporated into the country of the Hebrews. It was on a major international trade route. Uh, it was the, uh, pretty much the equivalent of having an interstate, a river, an airport, and a railroad. I mean, at that period of time, all the trade in the world pretty much moved through there from the east all the way up to Rome and into the Roman Empire. So we realize it was a major international trade route, a lot of economy there. They were known for their balsam wood, which was a lightweight, durable wood that was exported worldwide, and their palm dates, which was a major food source. So we understand there were quite a few things that were grown locally that were exported, but everything that came through town, of course, was part of the economy, which brings us to the second point, and that is the man. Poor Zacchaeus, about the only thing we know of him when we were little bitty kids, he was a wee little man. He was a short guy, but there's a whole lot more to this guy. First of all, we understand he was a publican, and that's the word that's used in the King James, and that's from the Greek or Italian word uh, that, that, that's entitled this. That means he was a tax collector. He collected taxes, specifically customs taxes, and that is he collected taxes on all the trade and all the goods that flowed through town. Now remember, it was a major trade route. So therefore, you're passing through town with a caravan of goods. Even though it came from somewhere else in the world, the publican could stop you and he could levy a tax because you want to be sure and catch the Roman tax and, and, and levy the Roman tax on those goods. So he understood everything that flowed through there, everything that was produced by there, all the local tradesmen as well as the people from out of town had to pay tax and they paid it to this guy. He levied the official tax rate from Rome plus his commission. That's how he made his livelihood. He was allowed to tack on a commission or maybe a, a tip, you know, a tip. So you would tip the guy because you had the privilege of paying taxes to the guy. And so in order to show your appreciation for him collecting taxes on your stuff, you'd have to pay him a tip. It was a mandatory thing. Here's the problem, though. He was allowed to exceed his allotted commission. And that's how they got rich. And you remember, he was a rich man. Luke makes sure to say he was a publican, he was a tax man, and he was rich. Now, this is an ethical problem. And, and that's pointed out in the book of Luke chapter 3 when John the Baptist was baptizing in the wilderness, he would say, you bring forth evidence of repentance before you can be baptized. In other words, this baptism does nothing for you if the heart's not right. So he would say, bring forth evidence of repentance. You remember the Pharisees and the scribes, they all came to him. He said, no, 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 not so fast. Not so fast because his message was, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Well, Publicans came to John the Baptist to be baptized of him. In Luke chapter 3, verse 12, they asked the question, what, what shall we do? And he said this, you collect no more than what's appointed to you. Everybody knows what you're doing. Cut it out. Stop it. Change your behavior. This is allowed by culture. This is allowed by law, but it's not allowed by the principles of God here were people who were taking advantage and overcharging folks, and he said, that needs to stop. So we understand they were not popular people because they were collect collecting taxes for Rome from their own countrymen. It's like, I, mean, I know the IRS is kind of hard to stomach right now, but what if 
What if all the money that was collected by the Internal Revenue Service was going to enrich Canada or some other country or, in our own history, England? Yeah, that started a war, didn't it? So we understand people have a problem with that. That was the man. And not only that, he was a tax collector, he was rich, he had authority. He was a chief tax collector, a chief tax collector. He was, he was a powerful man. He had a lot of other tax collectors working under him. So he was rich and he was powerful. Now, let's look at the excitement. Jesus was coming through town. Jesus was coming through Jericho, and it says quite specifically that he wanted to see, watch this close, who Jesus was. Now, we might say, oh, he wanted to see Jesus. No, 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 no. It says he wanted to see who Jesus was, which the, the message here is he had never seen him before. He had never seen Jesus before, and he wanted to catch a look at him. He wanted to see who Jesus was. That's, that's important here in a minute. But he couldn't catch a glimpse. He couldn't see Jesus. And that's the whole message of the song, isn't it? He was such a, a wee little man. He was, he was shorter than everybody around him. He couldn't catch a glimpse. Now, let me, let me mention this. Do you think that the townspeople were really courteous? And, oh, Zacchaeus, why don't you come and stand in front of me? Oh, absolutely not. Nobody was going to give him a break. Nobody liked the man because he was a tax collector. But he wanted to see who Jesus was. He had never had contact with Jesus, but obviously he had heard about him. Remember, as we mentioned last week, people were hearing about Jesus. And when they heard about Jesus, they wanted to see Jesus. He wanted to see Jesus. Had never seen him before. But he had heard enough about him. He wanted to see him, but he couldn't catch a glimpse. Now, here's a key thought. And we've mentioned this thought before. But it is a principle for us to look at. It's a practical thought. He could not catch a glimpse of Jesus because everybody else was in the way. He couldn't see Jesus because other people were blocking the view. Last week, we mentioned a passage of Scripture in Philippians chapter 1, verse 27, when it says, let your conduct be such as becomes or enhances the gospel. Do, do not behave in such a way where our conduct blocks the view of Jesus. See, of course, people know when we claim to be Christians. People know when we claim to be members of the church. And people see how we live. And can people see Jesus through us? Or is there something in our life, an attitude, a behavior, lifestyle, the way we treat others, that completely blocks their view. They cannot see Jesus through us. You see, he couldn't see Jesus because somebody else was standing in the way. Let's make sure we do not block the view of others seeing Jesus. Let them see Jesus in us, but at the very least, maybe they can see, just see Jesus through us, in spite of us. But let's not live lives that block the view of Jesus and turn people away from him. Where well, the solution was radical. Two things that he did. First of all, he ran. Now, we mentioned this back in the parable of the prodigal son. It was considered an embarrassment beneath the dignity of a mature adult Jewish man to ever run in public. I'm not sure exactly why, but they just were not to be seen running. But he did not care. He ran ahead of the parade because he couldn't see. And then he climbed a tree. That was totally unheard of when it came to an adult man. Now, when you're kids, climbing a tree is quite natural, quite normal. We all like kids. And he climbed up in a sycamore tree. Well, we've got a couple of sycamore trees over here. You got one in your yard. I got one over here. Everybody loves a sycamore tree. Not. I mean, because it's, it's, it's constant. I've got one growing down here. Sycamore leaves are about that big around, and they all congregate under my carport. I mean, the wind catches them. This is not exactly the kind of sycamore tree they had. The sycamore trees back then over there, it was a, a, a particular breed of sycamore tree, but it's like a mimosa tree. 
Now, a mimosa tree is just a delight to kids. I remember when we were kids, we had a couple of mimosa trees in our yard on 402 Robin Road in El Dorado, Arkansas. And all the neighborhood kids loved the mimosa trees. My grandparents, uh, the Goebbels, had a mimosa tree over there at Calhoun. The good thing about a mimosa tree, it had limbs kind of down low. You could get a good grip on a mimosa tree. Now, all the cousins would gather over at the grand folks' house. And we would all climb in the mimosa tree, and it was just spread out everywhere. And we all had our favorite limb. And the neighbors saw that, and they say, all these Goebel children just filled that tree up like a bunch of birds. We were all up there in the mimosa tree. Well, when you're a kid, it makes sense. But when you're a grown man, now how many of us guys are going to go on Main Street and climb a tree to get a better view of anything and not attract a little bit of attention? I mean, this was something that would be humiliating. But whatever it took to see Jesus, he was willing to do. Now, this guy gives us a lot of things to live by. Whatever it took to get a clear view of Jesus, what kind of effort are we willing to put forth to get closer to the Lord? What kind of effort? Or let's turn the coin around. What, how much inconvenience does it take to back us up, to keep us from being here at church? Now, you're here, and I'm glad you are. But how much inconvenience does it take for us to change our mind and we're, we're not coming to church? How much inconvenience does it take? We're not going to read our Bible. and That's where we see Jesus, isn't it? How much inconvenience does it take for us to pray? How much inconvenience does it take for us to serve and do something for the Lord? Does it take just a little bit and backs us up? This is a lot of inconvenience. This is a lot of deliberate effort. This was a lot of something that he would do that he, he really couldn't save face by doing this, but it was worth it if he could see who Jesus is was so he climbs up in the tree and he got ahead of the crowd and of course he's up in the tree and the crowd is down here and it says that Jesus came to the tree and he looked up and saw him so I know that he was above eye level Jesus looked up and saw him and then this is where it gets even more beautiful he looked up and saw him and he said to him Zacchaeus, hurry up and come get, get down out of the tree. He called him by name. Now realize, by the sentence structure in the first part of this story, he has never seen Jesus before, never encountered Jesus before. And Jesus knew his name. Now it's obvious he didn't know who Jesus was. Jesus was popular. But here he was in the crowd up in a tree, and Jesus stopped, and he said, Zacchaeus. He didn't know what was coming next because he knew of the rest of the town didn't like him. The people on the street were probably thrilled. They were thinking, boy, about time. Jesus has Zacchaeus treed, and he's got him pinned up there. And he says, Zacchaeus, hurry up and come down. I want to stay at your house. Oh, man, what a turning point. What a turning point. What an honor. Because it was always an honor for people to, to host a visiting dignitary. The whole crowd was around, the whole town was around Jesus. He was the most famous man around. And he says, I'm coming to your house today. What an honor. What an honor. In front of all the folks. Jesus said, I must stay. I've just got to stay at your house today. That's what he said. I've just, I have to stay at your house today. What an honor. So the people all applauded and cheered. No. It says they all began to grumble. They were not so excited. They said, this, Jesus is going to, he's going to, this guy's a sinner. This, this guy's a rascal. He's, he's a villain. He's, no. Now, here's the key turning point. In the English translation, it says, when they saw it, they all complained and said, he's gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. 
The English translation says, then Zacchaeus stood and said. Now, that article there in the original language is, but. That means it is in direct contrast to the preceding sentence. He's gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood and said, that means we're turning around. That means a key turning point. And the key turning point comes right after this word sinner. But Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Lord, I give half my goods to the poor. If I've taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I will restore fourfold. But he said, there's a change. His result, his, his encounter with Jesus resulted in a radical change of behavior. Now, this is quite interesting. He had gotten rich by unethical behavior that was allowed by law. And he said, this is, not, this is going to change. I'm going to give half of my goods to the poor. Half of it. Right off the top. Right off the top. We're not talking about a 10% tithe. We're not talking about just a little bit. He said, half of my goods I'm going to give to feed the poor. And he said, and if I've taken anybody from anything by false accusation. Now, this word if is probably not the if as in maybe it happened or maybe it didn't. It's more like since. He said, I'll restore them fourfold. This is quite interesting. The law did demand that if you took someone from something from someone. You had to restore it and then something. Now, fourfold in Exodus chapter 22, verse 1, fourfold only applied if you stole an ox or a, or a, a donkey and you slaughtered it. And now you, there's no way you could give that particular animal back to the owner because there was the commercial value, but then people, they got attached to their animals. You had to restore that fourfold. But, but then if you defrauded someone in the book of Leviticus, chapter 6, verse 5, it says you just add 20% to that. So the bare minimum was this. Zacchaeus, you could get by with anybody you defrauded. You could give them back their money plus 5%. I mean, 20%, a fifth of that. But you know what he did? He wanted to do more than the absolute minimum. Hmm. Here's a man who did something radical in order to see Jesus. And now when it was time to serve, he didn't want to just get by on, tell me what I have to do and I'll do that. He wanted to do more than the absolute minimum. And we learn a lot from this man. When it comes to our lives, we want to find out what Jesus wants us to do so we can just push our life up to that line? Or do we want to do more than what Jesus requires of us? More than what the law would say. I want to do more than... So he said, I'm going to restore them fourfold. Well, that was radical. He didn't have to do that. But he wanted to do more than enough. And here is something for us to think about. He said this publicly. He could have just had this conversation with Jesus. But he stood up, which tells us that he received him joyfully. and He had gone to his house. He welcomed him to his home. And he stood up, which tells us that they were already in the house. Banquet was already going on. People were still complaining and murmuring about the fact that he had gone to be a guest at Zacchaeus' house. So he stood up and he said this publicly. He said, Lord, this is what I'm going to do. Why do you think he did that? Very possible he wanted to protect the reputation of Jesus. In other words, Jesus welcoming this man and welcoming this man and he's going to be a guest in his house, he must be one of them. Look at him. There's Zacchaeus. How many dollars did he made off of me? I, mean, I can remember the time he just almost roughed me up on the street, my wagon load of goods, and man, he stuck it to me bad. I've got a little sore, but I hadn't got over that yet. And Jesus is going in there, piling it up with him. Like, he must be one of them. And so what he wanted to say is, no, 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 no. Things are different since Jesus came to my house. Things are different since I'm walking with the Lord. And here's what I'm going to do that's different. 
Now, the question is, are we willing to protect the reputation of Jesus by changing our behavior so we don't give the implication that Jesus is all good with how we're living? You know, I see these posts on Facebook. Well, Jesus went to eat with sinners as if like, don't say anything about my behavior. Jesus, he wasn't happy with this behavior. He was not happy with this at all. God's word wasn't happy with this at all. God's principles was not happy with this at all. Zacchaeus wanted to be sure that nobody would be able to look at his life and think that Jesus was okay with all this wrong that was going on there. So it could be that he was concerned about the reputation of Jesus. So he said, hey, I'm wearing the name of Jesus now. Things are going to be different. And I'm going to change my behavior to be consistent with the heart of Jesus Christ. The result of this is he received him joyfully. And Jesus said it this way, Today salvation has come to this house. He too is the son of Abraham. Wow. So we realize he's back in the fold because of Jesus Christ. But wait a minute. Where's the other rich man? If you remember, the title of this sermon is The Tale of Two Rich Men, where the other rich man is found in the preceding chapter, chapter 18, verse 18. Chapter 18 of Luke, verse 18, a certain ruler, a powerful man like Zacchaeus, Ask him, saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. You know the commandments. Now, catch this. Jesus didn't say, Keep these commandments and you'll inherit eternal life. He said, You know the commandments. And he specifically named these. Do not, do not, do not commit adultery. Do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your father and mother. These are commandments that could be seen by others. He didn't name all of them. And he said, all these I've kept from my youth up. Then Jesus heard these things. He said, you still lack one thing. Sell all that you have, distribute to the poor. You will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. When he heard this, he became very sorrowful. He was very rich. There's the second rich man. The second rich man was like Zacchaeus. He was very rich. The second rich man was like Zacchaeus. He was very powerful. The second rich man was not like Zacchaeus because he didn't get joy that day. You know why he did not get joy? He said no to Jesus. Now, let me say this. This is not about money. Zacchaeus didn't give all his money away. God didn't, Jesus didn't ask him to do it. Jesus hadn't even brought up money. Zacchaeus the one that brought it up. See, the problem wasn't the amount of money that he had. The problem with this man was his priorities. Something was more important than Jesus. Jesus knew that. So he said, you still lack one thing. You've done a lot of these things in your life. There's one thing between you and God. You love things more than you love God. Now, you get rid of these and everything will be all right. So he had the choice. Jesus just said, I see what's going on in your life. I see what's important to you. You change your priorities, and then you can walk with me. And it says he walked away from Jesus. He became very sorrowful. That word sorrowful means grief-stricken. It wasn't just like, ah, and just frustrated and walked away. He was crushed. He was crushed. And he walked away with sadness in his heart. But watch this. He walked away from Jesus with sadness in his heart. He was willing to go away sorrowful and hold on to his money than to let something go and say yes to Jesus Christ. You see, we had a tale of two rich men. Both of them were rich. One of them was joyful because he made a decision to walk with Christ. One of them was sorry and frustrated. He kept every stinking penny he had. Didn't lose a cent. And he was the most unhappy man in town. Money won't do it. Power won't do it. 
Popularity won't do it, and convenience and comfort will not do it. Only a walk with Jesus Christ. Any of these that get in the way between us and the Lord will only bring sorrow and frustration into our life. Zacchaeus found joy because he found Jesus, and Jesus did the impossible. The disciples thought it was, was, they just didn't know how to deal with this. They said, Jesus saw and became very sorrowful. He said, how hard is it who have riches to enter in the kingdom of heaven? It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And they said, who then can be saved? And he said, with men, this is impossible. With God, nothing is impossible. Now, fast forward. Here's a rich man, a wealthy man, still a wealthy man. And Jesus said, salvation has come to your house. Now, what did the disciples realize? Jesus just did the impossible. Jesus just did the impossible. What they thought was humanly impossible. Who can be saved then? He said, let me show you in Jericho. And here's a wealthy man who finds Jesus. See, it wasn't the money. It was the priority. And when Jesus became most important in his life, he found joy. And he found salvation. And the impossible became possible. You see, because humanly speaking, it's impossible for any of us to be saved. Sin has disqualified every last one of us from heaven. And it only takes one sin to disqualify us from heaven. That applies to all of us. So that impossible is for us to get to heaven by our own goodness. See, Jesus does the impossible. Through salvation, through his forgiveness, salvation is possible. Eternity is possible. Jesus does the impossible. And every single time somebody becomes saved, it's something that's not able to be experienced in any other way besides that God did it. It's humanly impossible for us to save ourselves and salvage our lives. So they looked around and said, well, it is a good day. Jesus just did the impossible. Not only did a rich man get saved, Zacchaeus got saved. Tell the two rich men, we fall into that category. One had joy in his house, the other walked away sorrowful. The only difference, everything else pretty much the same. One said yes to Christ, one said no. Other things were too important. That's the message this morning. What's our answer to Jesus as we stand and sing?